Welcome back to the battle. You're watching the Froggy Frog 9000 channel on a Sunday. Let's talk about the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. I'm going to read from Wikipedia here. Arthur Schopenhauer. Arthur Schopenhauer was a German philosopher. He is best known for his 1818 work, The Will as the, sorry, The World as Will and Representation in brackets expanded in 1844, wherein he characterizes the phenomenal world as the product of a blind and insatiable metaphysical will. Sounds a bit difficult, but actually Schopenhauer is one of the more easier to comprehend uh, philosophers. Proceeding from the transcendental idealism of Immanuel Kant, Schopenhauer developed an atheistic, metaphysical and ethical system that has been described as an exemplary manifestation of philosophical pessimism. That is true. That is true. Philo philosophy of Schopenhauer comes across as very uh, depressed, but it's not. Well, it's just, I, I would call, I would characterise it as unflinchingly truthful. He sees what he sees and he attempts to enunciate what he sees. A bit like a scientist. Arthur Schopenhauer, one of the greatest philosophers the world has ever seen. So we were just mentioning exemplary manifestation of philosophical pessimism. Rejecting the contemporaneous post-Kantian philosophies of German idealism, Schopenhauer was among the first thinkers in Western philosophy to share and affirm this to share and affirm significant tenets of Eastern philosophy, Eastern philosophy, e.g., asceticism, the world as appearance in brackets. I'm not sure if they mean a aestheticism or asceticism, because I don't know that asceticism can be defined as the world as appearance, anyways. And the words sound similar, but they're different. Having initially, and this is Wikipedia, so it could be wrong, yeah? Having initially arrived at similar conclusions as the result of his own philosophical work, though his work failed to garner substantial attention during his life, Schopenhauer has a posthumous impact across various disciplines, including philosophy, literature, and science. His writing on aesthetics, morality, and psychology would exert important influence on thinkers and artists throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Those who have cited his influence include Friedrich Nietzsche, Richard Wagner, Leo Tolstoy, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Erwin Schrödinger, is that Schrödinger's cat? Otto Rank, Gustav Mahler, the composer, Joseph Campbell, Albert Einstein, Carl Jung, the psychoanalyst, dream analyst, Thomas Mann, Emil Zola, George Bernard Shaw, see an American poet, George Louis Borges, and Samuel Beckett. Just reading from the basic tabulated data here on Einstein, uh, Einstein on uh, Arthur Schopenhauer. Born 22nd of February 1788, Danzig which is in Prussia, which is now called Gdansk, which is part of Poland. Died 21 September 1860, age 72, Frankfurt, German Confederation. Residence, Danzig, Hamburg, Frankfurt, nationality German. Education, Gymnasium, Illustre zu Gotha. University of Göttingen, University of Jena, PhD, 1813. Era, 19th century philosophy, region, Western philosophy. School, continental philosophy, post-Kantian philosophy, German idealism, transcendental idealism, metaphysical volunteer, volunteerism, philosoph philosophical pessimism, antinatalism, Institutions, University of Berlin, Main Interests, Metaphysics, Aesthetics, Ethics, Morality, Psychology. Sheesh, some big words there. Notable ideas. Will, fourfold, root of reason. That's, that's one. So will is one, and then fourfold root of reason is another. Hedgehog's Dilemma, that's one. 
philosophical pessimism, that's pretty straightforward, and anthropic principle. I might just read through those again. Notable ideas. Will, fourfold root of reason. Hedgehog's dilemma. Philosophical pessimism. Anthropic principle. And then they show the signature. I'm just reading here from Wikipedia. All right, so let's continue on. This is about Schopenhauer's life. Schopenhauer was born on 22nd of February 1788 in the city of Danzig, then part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, present-day Gdansk, Poland. On Heilgegeistgasse, that's in, that's impossible to pronounce. Heilgegeistgasse. I think Geist means spirit. Heiliger Geist Strasser. I'm probably butchering. I am butchering that word. Known in the present day as SW. Dutcher 47. So the house still exists. Wow. Uh, the son of Johanna Schopenhauer, Nie Trossiner, and Heinrich Floris Schopenhauer. Both descendants of wealthy German patrician families. When Danzig became part of Prussia in 1793, Heinrich moved to Hamburg, although his firm continued trading in Danzig. As early as 1799, Arthur started playing the flute. In 1805, Schopenhauer's father died, possibly by suicide. Arthur endured... So how old was he when his father died? He was born in 80, 88 and his father died in 05, so that's what, seven? So his father died when he was seven. Arthur endured two long years of drudgery as a merchant in honour of his dead father, but his mother soon moved with his sister Adele to Weimar, then the centre of German literature, where the opera is, Ger Weimar Opera. No, no, sorry, I'm thinking of somewhere else. I'm thinking of Bayreuth. Weimar's to do with the uh, Weimar era of debauchery. Uh... And, and hyperinflation uh, to pursue her writing career so his mother wanted to be a writer and moved to Weimar he dedicated himself wholly to studies at the Gotha Gymnasium Gymnasium in brackets Gymnasium Illustre zu Gotha in Saxe Gotha Altenburg but left in disgust after seeing one of the masters lampooned what precisely does that mean? After seeing one of the masters lampooned. I'm just going to do a quick search for this word lampooned. I think it means to be harpooned, doesn't it? Was he upset at how one of the masters was treated or something? Dictionary. Lampoon. Publicly criticise someone or something by using ridicule, irony or sarcasm. Either Schopenhauer ridiculed the master... Or the master was ridiculed and Schopenhauer left in disgust. Either way, it shows some kind of character of the young Schopenhauer. By that time, Johanna Schopenhauer had already opened her famous salon and Arthur was not compatible with what he considered its vain and ceremonious ways. Yeah, fair enough. Jeez. His mother opened a salon. That's like the French salon of Paris in King Louis XIV not sort of like a hair salon, totally different thing. Salon also different than the magazine salon. He was also disgusted by the ease with which his mother had forgotten his father's memory. Yeah, there you go. That's profound. He left to become a student at the University of Göttingen in 1809. So how old was he then? 1788 he was born, then 1809. So that's nine plus... Hang on, my maths is really bad, isn't it? So when his father died in 1805, he wasn't seven. He was uh, uh, two plus ten plus five. What's that? Ten, five, ten, 17. And he worked in the business for two or three years and out of honour for his father. So then he went to University of Gottingen in 1809. So 1788 to 1809 is 12 plus nine, right? 12 plus nine, 88. So he was 21 when he went to uni, fairly standard. There he studied there he studied metaphysics and psychology under Gottlob Ernst Schulz. 
the author of Anesidemus. Anesidemus, who advised him to concentrate on Plato and Immanuel Kant, Kant, Kant. In Berlin, from 1811 to 1812, he attended lectures by the prominent post-Kantian philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte and the theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher. What is Schleier? Schleier. Schleier. I can't pronounce it. I assume it's similar to the name Schumacher, which is Shoemaker. Self-explanatory. What's Schleiermacher? Makes Schleier. I'm talking gibberish. Arthur, Arthur, Arthur Schopenhauer had a notably strained relationship with his mother. <laughs> Don't we all? Uh, he wrote his first book on the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason while at university. On the fourfold, on the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason. Oh, well. While at univer that's a good title for a book. So he wrote that while he was at university. His mother informed him that the book was incomprehensible and it was unlikely that anyone would ever buy that crap. No, I made that up. It was unlikely that anyone would ever buy that buy a copy, but that's how she would have shamed him. In a in a fit of temper, Arthur Schopenhauer told her that his work would be read long after the rubbish she wrote would have been totally forgotten. Word. Word up. In fact, although they considered her novels of dubious quality, because uh, she went to be a writer in Weimar, Weimar the, the, Bro the Brockhaus publishing firm held her in high esteem because they consistently sold well. Well, well, how about that? Eh? His mum's book sold. Hans Brockhaus later recalled that when she brought them some of her son's work, his predecessor saw nothing in this manuscript that wanted to please one of our best... Let me start again. Hans Brockhaus later recalled that when she brought them some of her son's work his predecessors saw nothing in the manuscript but wanted to please one of our best-selling authors by publishing her son's work oh, okay they didn't like his work but she was one of their best-selling authors so on that basis they wanted to publish the work we published more we published more and more of her son arthur's work and today nobody remembers johanna but her son's works are in steady demand and contribute to brock house's reputation. He kept large portraits of the pair in his office in Leipzig for the edification of his new editors. That must be a direct quote from the publisher. In 1814, Schopenhauer began his seminal work, The World as Will and Representation, and that is a great book, Die Welt als Will and Vorstellung. He finished it in 1818, and so he started in 14, so it took him four years to write it, and Brockhaus published it that December. In Dresden in 1819, Schopenhauer fathered with a servant an illegitimate daughter who was born and died the same year. Uh, in 1820, Schopenhauer became a lecturer at the University of Berlin. He scheduled his lectures to coincide with the with those of the famous philosopher G. W. F. Hegel, whom Schopenhauer described as a clumsy charlatan. However, only five students turned up to Schopenhauer's lectures, and he dropped out of academia. A late essay on university philosophy expressed his resentment towards the work conducted in a Academies. So far, so goes Schopenhauer's life. Let's continue on. While in Berlin, Schopenhauer was named as a defendant in a lawsuit initiated by a woman named Caroline Marquette, or Marquis, or Marquet, or something. Marquis, it's Marquis, dear. She asked for damages, alleging that Schopenhauer had pushed her. According to Schopenhauer's court testimony, 
She deliberately annoyed him by raising her voice while standing right outside his door. Marquette alleged that sh- that Marquette alleged that the philosopher had assaulted and battered her after she refused to leave his doorway. Usually, it's the the guy trying to break the chick's door down. In this case, the chick's chasing the guy. It seems uh, her companion testified that she saw Marquette prostrate outside the outside his apartment. I think that means on the ground, laid out. Because Marquette won the lawsuit, Schopenhauer, ooh, feminism, Schopenhauer made payments to her for the next 20 years. Fuck. Schopenhauer made payments to her for the next 20 years. Are you kidding me? That's crazy. That's something that would happen in the current year. Not in 1819. Twenty, tw- twenty years. What is she like, alimony ex-wife or something? That's crazy. When she died, he wrote a copy of her death certificate. Obit annus, abit onus. The old woman dies. The burden is lifted. <laughs> In 1819, the fortunes of his mother and sister and himself were threatened by the failure of the firm in Danzig in which his father had been a director and shareholder. His sister accepted and his, sis- his sister accepted a compromise compensation package of 70%, but Schopenhauer angrily refused this and eventually recovered 9,400 tailors. I don't know how that compares to what his sister got, whether he did a better deal or worse. In 1821, he fell in love with 19-year-old opera singer Caroline Richter. 1821, so how old was he then? 30-something, 34? Uh, Caroline Richter, in brackets, called Medon. I guess that was her stripper name and had a relationship with her for several years, but did not marry her. When he was 43, 43, when he was 43 years old, he took interest in 17-year-old Flora Weiss, Weiss, but she rejected him as recorded in her diary. And that's a famous recording in her diary. I think she called him an old man, or or she said he, he was smelly or something. So he was 43 and she was 17. In 1831, a cholera epidemic... Jeez, they had a bad time back then, didn't they? In 1831, a cholera epidemic broke out in Berlin and Schopenhauer left the city. Schopenhauer settled permanently in Frankfurt in 1833, where he remained for the next 27 years, living alone, except for a succession of pet poodles named Atman and Butts. So there was a cholera epidemic in 1831, which broke out in Berlin. Schopenhauer left Berlin. Schopenhauer settled permanently in Frankfurt two years later, in 1833. I wonder what he did in those two years. Probably travelled to Europe or something. Where he remained for the next 27 years, living alone with his poodles. The numerous notes that he made during these years, amongst others on ageing, were published posthumously under the title Senilia. Sounds like senile, senilia. Schopenhauer had a robust constitution, but in 1860 his health began to deteriorate. He died of pulmonary respiratory failure on 21 September 1860. So how old was he then? 72. While sitting at home on his couch, he was 72. There you go. All right, so continuing on. So then looking, this is Wikipedia, then looking at the philosophy section of the Arthur Schopenhauer Wikipedia entry. Philosophy, the world as representation. And this is one of my favourite philosophical ideas, the world as will and representation. Schopenhauer saw his philosophy as a continuation of that of Kant, 
I've read Kant. I could never understand Kant. Maybe I was too young, but uh, maybe it doesn't make sense. And used the results of his epistemological investigations, that is, transcendental idealism, as starting point for his own. There you go. Uh, and this is a quote here, I think. My philosophy is founded on that of Kant and therefore presupposes a thorough knowledge of it. Was Kant all about priory and a priori? Can't quite remember. Kant's teaching produces in the mind of everyone who has comprehended it a fundamental change which is so great that it may be regarded as an intellectual new birth, says Schopenhauer. It alone is able to really, let me start again, it alone is able really to remove the inborn realism which proceeds from the original character of the intellect which neither Berkeley nor Malebranche succeeded in doing. So he's saying can't succeed in doing something previous philosophers failed for they remain too much in the universal while Kant goes into the particular and indeed in a way that is quite unexampled both before and after him and which has quite a peculiar and we might say um, immediate effect upon the mind in consequence of which it undergoes a complete undeception that's interesting and forthwith looks at all things in another light only in this way can anyone become susceptible to the more positive expositions which i have to give so in other words schopenhauer if i'm not mistaken from that quote sorry i read it quite haltingly schopenhauer is basically saying if you haven't read kant you can't understand me pun intended and if you have read Kant, you'll never look at the world the same way again. He's sort of saying you can't perceive higher ideas without the prerequisite of first having read Kant. Something along those lines. Let's continue on. Theory of perception. So this is to do with the five senses, the way you perceive the world, your eyes, your ears, sense of touch, smell, taste. Theory of Perception. In November 1813, Goethe invited Schopenhauer for research on his theory of colours, although Schopenhauer considered colour theory to be a minor matter. He accepted the invitation out of admiration for Goethe. Nevertheless, these investigations led him to his most important discovery in epistemology, finding a, de finding a demonstration Finding a demonstration for the part, let me start again. Finding a demonstration for the a priori nature of causality. The fuck does that mean? So, Schopenhauer went and hung out with Goethe, talking about colours, and then he figured something out. And there's that word a priori, which I think is all what Kant is all about. Yeah, what the heck? Okay, Kant openly admitted that it was Hume's sceptical assault on causality that motivated the critical investigation of Critique of Pure Reason. Whose book is that? Critique of Pure Reason, is that Kant's book? I think that's Kant's book. In it, he gives an elaborate proof to show that causality is given a, pri a priori. And I'm just trying to give you a definition in my own words of what priori and a priori is. It's sort of like knowing something without ever without having ever encountered it. Let me just try and recall what Kant was all about with these priori and a priori. A priori, Kant was saying, is the notion sort of to do with instinct. That something could never have encountered something before, but somehow it has a knowledge of it. An example I'd give you is a hatchling eagle at some point literally at some point jumps out of the nest and literally jumps off the cliff if you watch the David Attenborough documentary it's literally without even looking where it's going 
It can barely walk, it's almost never stood up before. The fledgling eagle jumps out of the nest, which is perched high up on a mountain, usually on a sheer cliff, overlooking a magnificent vista. And that young eagle, barely with its feathers dry, it falls through the air, and at some point it decides to start flying. And that would indicate an a priori knowledge that the eagle has, that it can fly, or at least that it can jump out of that nest and all will be well. That's the notion of a priori knowledge that Kant came up with. Carrying on, con uh, continuing on. Uh, where did I... Let me just find my place. Right, I'm going to start this paragraph again. Kant openly admitted that it was Hume's sceptical assault on causality that motivated the critical investigations of critique of pure reason. In it, he gives an elaborate proof to show that causality is given a priori. A priori. In it, he gives an elaborate proof to show that causality is given a priori. Causality is given a priori. I don't get what that means. I'll try and find out. After G. E. Schulz had made it plausible that Kant had not disproven Hume's scepticism, it was up to those loyal to project, loyal to the project of Kant to prove this important matter. The difference between the approach of Kant and Schopenhauer was this. Kant simply declared that the empirical content of perception is given, the empirical content, the experience content of perception is given to us from the outside as an expression. Oh, I think I know where they're going with this. Kant simply declared that the empirical content of perception is given to us from outside an expression with which Schopenhauer often expressed his dissatisfaction. Schopenhauer was all about perception being, no, not so much perception, but the will, which is sort of a potentially an internal thing to, a, to something that lives, uh, giving it some level of awareness, which you could call perception. Anyways, uh, which he often did expressed his dissatisfaction. He, on the other hand, was occupied with how do we get this empirical content of perception? How is it possible to comprehend subjective sensations limited to my skin as the objective perception of things that lie outside of me? Here's a quote from Schopenhauer. The sensations in the hand of a man born blind on feeling an object of cubic shape are quite uniform and the same on all sides and in every direction. The edges, it is true, press upon a smaller portion of his hand. Still nothing at all like a cube is contained in these sensations. His understanding, however, draws the immediate and intuitive conclusion from the resistance felt that his resistance must have a cause which then presents itself through that conclusion as a hard body and through the movements of his arms in feelings through the movement of his arms in feeling the object while the hand's sensation remains unaltered he constructs the cubic shape in space if the representation of a cause and of space together with their laws had not already existed within him, the image of a cube could never have proceeded from those successive sensations in his hand. I think there what Schopenhauer is saying is that if a blind man didn't have some a priori imagery in his mind's eye of what a cube is, when he feels the cube with his hands, he wouldn't be able to describe the shape of the cube. That's an interesting idea. Not sure if I agree or disagree, but uh, talking about a priori knowledge is uh, not easy because it's on the edge of our perception. 
Causality is therefore not an empirical concept drawn from objective perception, but objective perception presupposes knowledge of causality. Hereby Hume's scepticism is disproven. By this intellectual operation comprehending every effect in our sensory organs as having an external cause, the external world arises. With vision, finding the cause is essentially simplified due light acting in straight lines. We are seldom conscious of the process that interprets the double sensation in both eyes as coming from one object. That turns the upside down impression and that adds depth to make from the planimetrical data stereometrical perception with distance between objects. Schopenhauer stresses the importance of the intellectual nature of perception. The senses furnish the raw material by which the intellect produces the world as a representation. He set out his theory of perception for the first time in On Vision and Colours and in, and in the subsequent editions of Fourfold Root an extensive exposition is given in page 21 I think it is or maybe chapter 21 so that was a really profound thing that Schopenhauer stumbled upon there observed of nature what he's really getting at there about the blind man uh, feeling out the shape of a cube and, and all of that is he's basically realizing he, he's basically realizing that the world is a representation to the living thing caused by the sensory organs of that living thing and processed as data by the living things intellectual system so for example a human being that's not colorblind looks at a rainbow and sees the colours of the rainbow. A deep sea fish, if you were to somehow bring it up out of the four kilometre deep murky depths, one of those fish that has a lantern dangling in front of its snout, if you were to bring that fish up and uh, get it to look at a rainbow, would it actually see the same colours that a human sees? Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. But the point is the deep sea fish has a different model of eye than the Mark I eyeball that a human has. And same for that matter, the deep sea fish and the human have different types of eye than say a bee. I've heard it said that bees see in ultraviolet or that they can see, maybe not infrared, but they can, I think it was ultraviolet or something like that. There are electromagnetic sensors that humans have produced me uh, mechanical and electrical devices that can see at night time through various different means either passive using the moonlight or active using a torch that shines a light but the light is not visible to the human eye the light is I think infrared light and that or laser or something some, something like that I think it's infrared light and then that gets processed and turned into an image by the microchip and then a bee, if a bee sees it. And another thing is that there's FLIR cameras that can see heat. Humans can't necessarily see heat. We can see flame, which implies heat, but we can't see heat as such. Whereas uh, FLIR cameras can see heat. We've all seen that footage of the OJ Simpson high-speed car chase type uh, pursuits in the USA where the, the Bell 206 Jet Ranger helicopter with the FLIR forward looking infrared is hovering over a forest and you can see a human being running and hiding in the forest and he's, he's hidden down and he thinks no one's seeing him and the, the cops are being directed usually with a, a hound alongside to are being directed by the the chopper to the location where the fugitive is hiding because they've got that infrared that can see at night and can see heat so there's different types of perception devices out there. The Mark I eyeball is only one 
and it's not the be all and end all. It's limited in what it can perceive, which means that humans are limited in what they can perceive. Which indicates to us, doesn't it, that the world is a representation. The world is a representation. The world is represented to us by our sensory organs. In our case, the Mark I eyeball, our hearing through our eardrums and vestibular apparatus and cochlea and so on, feeding data to the brain. And then the brain interprets that data and turns it into an image or a sound which we can then perceive in our consciousness as the world. Doesn't it then follow that if our sensory devices change, so too does our representation of the world? Doesn't it follow that the bee, with its different eyes, sees the world differently than how a deep sea fish sees the world or than how a human sees the world? There are animals with binocular vision, like a human or an owl or an eagle. And then there are animals with different types of vision, like those lizards that have independent eyeballs that can look in different directions at the same time. Uh, spiders with their many clusters of eyes what are they perceiving the world as and we're only talking about vision what about a cat seeing at night time with the mirrors in the back of its eyes that reflect the light the cat seems to be able to see much better at night time than a human so the world is represented to us by our sensory organs and then it's processed in our brain also if you could Theoretically, if you could hook up a human eyeball to a bee instead of the bee's eyes, so the bee's brain is hooked up to the human eyeball, what would the bee see? So in other words, the eye-brain interaction is mostly, well, so far we've talked about the effect of the eye on how the brain perceives the world but also a brain is geared in a certain way. And I believe that a fly or a, or a bee, its brain, because it's a different model of brain, if you like, would perceive the world differently than another animal, another living thing. So in a nutshell, that's how I would describe what I've just read in Wikipedia so far about the world uh, as a representation and the theory of perception and Schopenhauer sort of gleaned this perception of these things by talking to Goethe about theory of colour. So I just wanted to add my two cents worth there on the world as representation which is one half of Schopenhauer's excellent book The World as Will and Representation. Now let's talk about the will. The world as will Schopenhauer developed a system which is known as metaphysical voluntarism. And here's a quote. Uh, the kernel and chief point of my doctrine is metaphysic, is metaphysic proper and is... Uh, I can't read. The kernel and chief point of my doctrine, its metaphysic proper, is this that what Kant opposed as thing in itself to mere appearance called more decidedly by me representation and what he held to be absolutely unknowable that this thing in itself I say this substratum of all appearances that therefore of the whole nature is nothing but what we know directly and intimately and find within ourselves as will that accordingly this will far from being inseparable from and even as an even a mere result of knowledge differs radically and entirely from and is quite independent of knowledge which is secondary uh, and of later origin and can consequently subsist and manifest itself without knowledge that this will being the one and only thing in itself the sole truly real primary metaphysical thing in a world in which everything else is appearance is only appearance 
i.e. mere representation, gives all things, whatever they may be, the power to exist and to act. It is absolutely identical with the will we find within us and know as intimately as we can know anything that on the other hand knowledge with its substratum the intellect is a merely secondary phenomenon differing completely from the will only accompanying its higher degrees of objectification and not essential to it that we are never able therefore to infer absence of will from absence of knowledge that's a quote from Schopenhauer on the will in nature introduction but what Schopenhauer is basically saying is that there's something that pre-exists before knowledge and that is the will you could sort of put it this way you could say that instinct in living things there is always instinct but in higher living things not only is there instinct but there's knowledge but there doesn't have to be knowledge for there to be instinct and instinct is not knowledge but it kind of acts as though it were knowledge it's almost like an, a knowledge without ever having been exposed to knowledge and you can see it in everything that lives that it has the instinct to live and remember we're talking about Schopenhauer's concept of the will and in a nutshell the will is uh, as Schopenhauer was describing it the will is a blind uncaring irrational supernatural force that permeates the universe and inhabits anything that lives the will doesn't inhabit anything that doesn't live like a rock doesn't have will but a blade of grass swaying in the breeze on a prairie does have will it has the will to live and anything that lives has the will to live and here's a crazy thing to wrap your head around a blade of grass and a lion they both have the will to live and they both have equal measure of the will to live so you might think that because a lion is a higher form of life than grass that the lion wants to live more it's not so the grass also wants to live just as much as the lion wants to live although the grass doesn't have any consciousness or any knowledge it has that kind of a priori knowledge it has that instinct that will to live and it expresses itself that we can see because it colonizes as much square meterage of prairie as it possibly can as nutrients and lack of predators and competitors and abundance of sunlight and uh, rainfall will allow it to propagate itself in other words the grass has the will to live and it manifests that will to live as a desire to spread itself as much as possible across the surface of the earth so we don't and then to, to essentially photocopy itself which is what life does isn't it it's reproduction so the will to live Schopenhauer is saying is something that's in equal measure in a lion or a human or an ant or I guess even a bacteria everything that has life in it wants to live and as part of that it wants to reproduce itself as much as it possibly can and that's a kind of a knowledge a knowledge that is not born of experience but is inborn instinctively in anything that lives be it a blade of grass or Schopenhauer himself when he was alive of course uh, continuing on for Schopenhauer human desire was futile illogical directionless and by extension was all human action in the world there's the pessimism Einstein paraphrased his views as follows man can indeed do what he wants but he cannot will what he wants in this sense he adhered to the Fichtean principle of idealism the world is for a subject this idealism so presented immediately commits to it to an ethical attitude unlike the purely epistemological concerns of Descartes and Berkeley to Schopenhauer the will is a blind force 
that controls not only the actions of individual intelligent agents but ultimately all observable phenomena and evil to be terminated via mankind's duties asceticism and chastity chastity asceticism means basically not eating very much not smoking that sort of thing and chastity means not reproducing ultimately he is credited with one of the most famous opening lines of philosophy the world is my representation Friedrich Nietzsche was greatly influenced by this idea of will although he eventually rejected it ah uh, what I don't think he eventually rejected it art and aesthetics for Schopenhauer human desiring willing and craving cause suffering or pain a temporary way to escape this pain is through ascetic aesthetic not ascetic aesthetic contemplation a method comparable to zapp's sublimation aesthetic contemplation allows one to escape this pain albeit temporarily because it stops one perceiving the world as mere presentation instead one no longer perceives the world as an object of perception therefore as subject to the principle of sufficient grounds time space and causality from which one is separated rather one becomes one with that perception quote one can thus no longer separate the perceiver from the perception unquote from the world as will and representation section 34 from this immersion with the world one no longer views oneself as an individual who suffers in the world due to one's indi individual will but rather becomes a subject of cognition to be a, co a subject of cognition to a perception that is pure will less and timeless section 34 where the essence ideas of the world are shown art is the practical consequence of this brief aesthetic contemplation as it attempts to depict one's immersion with the world thus tries to depict the essence pure ideas of the world music for Schopenhauer was the purest form of art because it was the only one that depicted the will itself without it appearing as subject to the principle of sufficient grounds therefore as an individual object according to Daniel Albright's according to Daniel Albright Schopenhauer thought that music was the only art that did not merely copy ideas but actually embodied the will itself he deemed music a timeless universal language comprehended everywhere that can imbue global enthusiasm if possession of a significant if in possession of a significant melody all right so what the hell was that all about let me explain so the beginning of that paragraph there is talking about for Schopenhauer human desiring willing and craving cause suffering or pain so the not just human in fact but anything that lives and so Schopenhauer was with his pessimistic worldview was saying that the life force was this kind of again blind irrational illogical uh, supernatural force that permeates the universe that doesn't care about the living things that it inhabits the will it just wants to continue and to reproduce and to make itself larger and larger and larger a presence in the in reality in existence in the universe hence grass not containing itself to one square meter of prairie grass colonizing the entire earth because it has the will to live and it wants to reproduce same same with humans or flies or ants anything that lives reproduces itself to its maximum capability in accordance with the hallmark characteristics of the will if something is a rock uh, it can't feel pain if something is imbued with the will the will it can feel pain so Schopenhauer is saying that the will causes pain and suffering and he's offering a solution to this he's saying that through art instead of through 
and 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 he, instead of through eating and sex and that sort of thing, in, instead through art, through music particularly, and also art, essentially through aesthetics, we can temporarily overcome the pain of existence caused by the will. Does that make sense? And a key further hallmark tenet of observing the characteristics of the will is that it's never satisfied. It always wants more. You eat and you're satisfied temporarily and then sometime later you feel hungry again. Never satisfied, which is part of the instinct of something that lives. Uh, again with other things like like with binge eating on chocolate or drinking alcohol or just eating food uh, or, or uh, having sex these things are things that are of the will and Schopenhauer saying although those things come across very obviously as pleasurable the highest form of pleasure to him is in art in the aesthetics of art in listening to music particularly listening to music for example like uh, Richard Wagner's music because it's so able to uh, reproduce music is so able to reproduce good feelings of of it, that, that you can have without actually experiencing something that causes the good feeling so uh, What's, what's an example of that? Sometimes you listen to music and you, you get a shiver up your spine or you get some physiological reaction. So that's the power of music. Music's very powerful to make you feel a certain way. So Schopenhauer's positing that music as part of aesthetics is the way to, not to achieve happiness, but to temporarily alleviate the suffering caused by the will so that's that mathematics Schopenhauer's realist views on mathematics are evident in his criticism of contemporary attempts to prove parallel postulate and Euclidean geometry writing shortly before the discovery of hyperbolic geometry demonstrated the logical independence of the axiom and I'm not really going to read all this stuff about mathematics because I haven't really looked into it yet in fact, uh, let's let's just pause it here, and I'm going to bring up. So this is all Wikipedia, but I'm got, and there's a lot of other stuff here. But like Schopenhauer's views on women, I'm just going to bring up some. I'm going to pause it here, and I'm going to bring up some quotes, some famous quotes from Schopenhauer. I'll be back in a tick. Okay, back again, and I'm just looking at some quote websites, and let's run through some quotes that these websites are attributing to. Schopenhauer. I say that because the quote could be misspelled or miswritten or it could be the quote of someone else but let's go through it. Mostly they're accurate. They're probably 99% accurate, I reckon. Here's the quotes. Talent, these are Schopenhauer. Talent hits a target no one else can hit. Genius hits a target no one else can see. Arthur Schopenhauer. Compassion is the basis of morality. These are all Schopenhauer quotes. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as self-evident. So I think a lot of the time people attribute that to Gandhi, but Schopenhauer predates Gandhi by like a hundred years, and Schopenhauer said it. A man can himself only so long... Let me start again. A man can be himself only so long as he is alone, and if he does not love solitude, he will not love freedom for it is only when he is alone that he is really free. I can identify with that strongly. Mostly it is loss which teaches us about the worth of things. Again, genius. Happiness consists in frequent repetition of pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Every man takes the limits of his own field of vision for the limits of the world. There he is sort of harking back to the world as representation. Compassion for animals is intimately associated with goodness of character, and it may be confidently asserted that he who is cruel to animals cannot be a good man. And that sort of ties in with the well-known phenomena that psychopaths as children will 
often torture animals, which normal children just don't do. The person who writes for Fools is always sure of a large audience. The person who writes for Fools is always sure of a large audience. I get it, I get it. I was a bit slow on the uptake there. Uh, it is difficult to find happiness within oneself, but it is impossible to find it anywhere else. That's interesting. He's saying look inward for happiness. I'm digging it, I'm digging it. Arthur, I'm digging it. That when you're buying books, you're optimistically thinking you're buying the time <laughs> to read them, which is a paraf it says in brackets that it's a paraphrase from Schopenhauer. That's interesting. One should use common words to say uncommon things. That's a really good sort of tenet of Schopenhauer's way of doing things. He's one of the few philosophers that you can actually understand. He's actually saying something concrete such as the world as will and representation. We forfeit three-fourths of ourselves in order to be like other people. So Schopenhauer's big on the idea of personal freedom and that being tied into being solitary and looking inwards for happiness. A sense of humour is the only divine quality of man. Treat, w treat a work of art like a prince. Let it speak to you first. Thus the task is not so much to see what no one yet has seen, but to think what nobody yet has thought about that which everybody sees. That's pretty profound. Great men are like eagles and build their nests on some lofty solitude. Excellent. Great men are like eagles and build their nests on some lofty solitude. Eagles fly high, eagles fly alone. That's not a Schopenhauer quote, I just added that in. And I got that from that entrepreneur. What's his name? The American one, Penner, Dan Penner. Religion is the masterpiece of art, of animal training, for it trains people as to how they shall think. Let me read that again. Religion is the masterpiece of the art of animal training. I get it now. Religion is the masterpiece of the art of animal training, for it trains people as to how they shall think. Masterpiece of animal training. Hmm. A high degree of intellect tends to make a man unsocial. That clearly explains a lot. Uh, life is a constant process of dying. <laughs> There's the pessimism of Schopenhauer. Uh, it's pretty funny. Hope is the confusion of the desire for a... Tr Let me start again. Hope is the confusion of the desire for a thing with its probability. Ah, oh, yeah, okay, that makes perfect sense. Hope is the confusion of the desire for a thing with its probability. No rose without a thorn, but many a thorn without a rose. What's he saying there? Is he saying that all women are bitches, but some of them are bitches and they're hot, but a lot of them are just bitches and they're not hot? <laughs> That's my take on that. Uh, marrying means to halve one's rights and double one's duties. Yeah, Schopenhauer was like the original MGTOW men going their own way, uh, which is something I dig about Schopenhauer. I have not yet spoken to my, l I have not yet spoken my last word about women. I believe that if a woman succeeds in withdrawing from the mass, or rather raising herself from above the mass, she grows ceaselessly and more than a man. I think he's saying that a woman has the potential to be great if she separates herself from the herd. But what woman does that? Maybe Ayn Rand. That's probably about it. Uh, or Mar Marie Curie, the lady that discovered radium. Probably two examples there. Schopenhauer really gets down to fundamental things which most of us consider so obvious that we don't even devote two seconds of our conscious power towards thinking about such as the difference between something, the, dis the definition of something that lives and something that doesn't live, a rock versus a bee, for example, and what characteristics are inherent to those things. 
which is what I like about Schopenhauer. The world is my idea, says Schopenhauer, and that sounds at first glance like it's arrogant, but really it's just sort of a statement of fact. The world is my idea, which shows that if the brain changes, the world changes. So not just the difference between the perception devices, the eyes, the ears, the touch, the smell, the taste, but also the processing intellectual power. And in Wikipedia there's that example that Schopenhauer gave of humans having two eyes, but not perceiving the world as two, uh, two circles of, of sight, but actually both eyes combining together to produce a stereo vision so you don't have two separate single visions you have one vision even though you've got two eyes which indicates that the brain has some altering or processing of the images that it's receiving from the eye that it can in our consciousness combine the two eyes imagery into one image change alone is eternal perpetual immortal that reminds me of the quote that time is the great destroyer. Almost all of our sorrows spring out of our relations with other people. There is no more mistaken path to happiness than worldliness. No more mistaken path to happiness than worldliness. So Schopenhauer is saying, if you seek happiness amongst other people, it's a mistaken path to happiness. If we were not also interested in ourselves, life would be so uninteresting that no one of us would be able to endure it. Hmm. You can see he's really, really, really pessimistic. But I think he was quite happy. He wasn't a he he himself wasn't laboring under pessimism he was merely looking at the world and saying what he was seeing schopenhauer's father was a rich mill owner or something like that in danzig so uh schopenhauer sort of grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth he never lacked for money because his father died when he was how old 17 schopenhauer schopenhauer never lacked money and that, of course, is a prerequisite for happiness, in my opinion. The life of every individual viewed as a whole and in general, and when only its most significant features are emphasised, is really a tragedy. But gone through in detail, it has the character of a comedy. Tragedy comedy. This is all quotes from Schopenhauer. Wealth is like sea water. Wealth is like sea water. The more we drink, the thirstier we become, and the same is true of fame. That sort of ties into Schopenhauer's notion that the will, one of the aspects of the will, is that it's never satisfied, i.e. You, um, you eat a chocolate cake, and uh, the next day you, you want to eat another chocolate cake. Never satisfied, never permanently satisfied. And that sort of ties into the quote, you can't have your cake and eat it too. The safest way of not being very miserable is not to expect to be very happy. <laughs> Arthur Schopenhauer. There you go. The safest way of not being very miserable is not to expect to be very happy. It makes sense. He's sort of saying, set your expectations. Faith is like love. It does not let itself be forced. Life swings like a pendulum backward and forward between pain and boredom. Arthur Schopenhauer. The business of the novelist is not to relate great events, but to make small ones interesting. I think... Tolstoy does a pretty good job of that in his novels such as War and Peace. You can open up any page of War and Peace, a very long novel, and I think the most the the best novel in the world or the most popular or something like that. 
any page of that or that or maybe it's the longest novel in the world any page of that gigantic novel you can open it up and there's some small detail there that's almost immediately entertaining polite politeness is to human nature what warmth is to wax so what it wa it melts human nature is that good or bad not sure if he's saying it's good to be polite or not. Music is the melody whose text is the world. Yeah. Music's a funny thing. You can play music to a cat and the cat won't respond. You can play music to a three-month-old baby and the baby will respond. So there's something to do with music that not all life forms appreciate. I wonder if there are any other forms of life, say monkeys or something, that might have some response to music. Sleep is the interest we have to pay on the capital which is called in at depth, and the higher the rate of interest and the more regularly it is paid, the further the date of redemption is postponed. I think he's saying if you get a lot of sleep you'll live a long time. I have long held the opinion that the amount of noise that anyone can bear undisturbed stands in inverse proportion to his mental capacity and therefore be regarded as a pretty fair measure of it. In other words, he's saying you're a dum-dum if you can put up with lots of noise. And if you can't tolerate noise, you're very smart. Reading is thinking with someone else's head instead of one's own. That's interesting. We seldom think of what we have, but always of what we lack. There are very few who can think, but every man wants to have an opinion, and what remains but to take it ready-made from others instead of forming opinions for himself. Rascals are always sociable, and the chief sign that a man has any nobility in his character is the little pleasure he takes in others' company. He's big on the solitary lifestyle as being a sign of good things in a person's character. What a man is contributes much more to his happiness than what he has or how he is regarded by others. I think this would probably flow a lot better in, in, in Schopenhauer's native tongue than when translated into English. What a man is contributes much more to his happiness than what he has or how he is regarded by others. Don't know. Ordinary people merely think how they shall spend their time. A man of talent tries to use it. Spending time, using time. Yeah that I could clamber to the frozen moon and draw the ladder after me. <laughs> He's wanting to be alone. To find out your real opinion of someone, judge the impression you have when you first see a letter from them. Okay. Whatever torch we kindle, and whatever space it may illuminate, our horizon will always remain encircled by the depth of night. So he's saying that perception is limited by what we can see. There is some wisdom in taking a gloomy view in looking upon the world as a kind of hell, and in confining one's efforts to securing a little room that shall not be exposed to the fire truth. Scholars are those who have read in books, but thinkers, men of genius, world enlighteners and reformers of the human race are those who have read directly in the book of the world. That's a good quote. For where did Dante get the material for his hell if not from this actual world of ours? These are not the best quotes because they're not his most controversial quotes. Let's look at another website. <laughs> okay. 
Schopenhauer on women and love. Women are divided into women deceived and deceiving women. Women women are divided into women deceived and women no no. Women are divided into women deceived and deceiving women. One thing just occurred to me is I don't think Schopenhauer ever had any kids. The woman is the the woman the woman is an animal with long hair and short sighted classic Schopenhauer. <laughs> long hair and short sighted. Getting and he's talking about perception there, more like intellectual sight. Getting married is doing everything possible to get caught by someone in horror. All love is pity. I might just put the Schopenhauer Wikipedia down for the moment and leave it there. So that's some Schopenhauer for you and some driving of cars in Forza Horizon 3. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe and consider becoming a patron on Patreon or donating for your cryptocurrency of choice.